Hey everyone, welcome to episode 29 of Make Moments Matter, a music education podcast, where I share lesson ideas, songs, games, and inspiring things for your elementary music classroom. My name is David Rao, and I am the music teacher who blogs at makemomentsmatter.org. You can also find my ideas on Facebook, Pinterest, Instagram, Twitter, and a variety of other platforms when you search my name or Make Moments Matter. Normally on this podcast, I spend the whole episode sharing teaching tips, lesson ideas, tricks for classroom management, and a whole host of other topics. But for the next few weeks, I'll be doing something a little different. In these episodes, I'll be taking some time away from the normal routine to conduct a series of interviews with music teachers from around the country. I want to take a little time to really think and talk about ORF Schulwerk, what it is, what it isn't, pedagogy, teaching tips, what you can expect should you decide to do training or join a local ORF chapter, and more. Maybe you've been to a workshop at a local ORF chapter or have seen a presenter at your state conference who has trained in ORF Schulwerk. These sorts of experiences are fantastic, but don't always give you the full picture. And I want more people to really know about the ins and outs of the ORF approach, how to utilize those pitch percussion instruments that are so often associated with ORF work, ideas about teaching recorder, movement, resources, and a whole lot more. Throughout this series of conversations, I'll be talking with leaders in the world of ORF work and people who have lived with this teaching approach. If you missed the last two episodes, you'll definitely want to go back and hear the other conversations in this series. In this series of conversations, we cover a variety of Orff Schulberg related topics from recorder to pitch percussion, lesson scaffolding, movement, online resources, and a lot more. In this episode, I get the chance to talk with Laura Burka Peterson. Laura teaches general and choral music at St. Patrick's Episcopal Day School in Washington, D.C. Laura earned her Bachelor of Science in Music Education from Gettysburg College and completed her Master of Music in Music Education at George Mason University. She holds Level 3 and Master Level 4 certifications in Orff Schulwerk Pedagogy from George Mason University and has studied at the Orff Institute in Salzburg, Austria. Laura teaches movement in AOSA-approved summer teacher education courses in Denver and LA and is an invited presenter both locally and nationally. She currently serves as Region 4 representative on the National Board of Trustees of the American Orff Schulwerk Association and is the chair of the Professional Development and Research Committee. Before I get to my interview with Laura, I wanted to talk a little bit about resources that you can find and put to use right now in your classroom. I've been getting messages and emails from a lot of folks out there about how this podcast series has inspired you to go to a local ORF chapter workshop or check out a nearby teacher education levels training. And let me say, those emails and messages are so exciting. If this podcast series has inspired or encouraged you to do something new in your classroom or pursue more ORF training, send me a message or email because I would love to hear your story. Maybe these podcast episodes have really excited you and you want to learn more now and don't want to wait for some summer levels training or local chapter workshops. Well, if that's you, I wanted to share a few print resources that have been really influential for me and for a lot of other ORF teachers out there and the resources that might help you along in your journey, things you can get right now. The first book I would point you towards is the book called The Schulwerk by Karl Orff himself. This is really Orff reminiscing about the people and events concerned with the Schulwerk, the evolution of the instrumentarium, all the instruments that we use in Orff classrooms, early publications of of his, and the development of the Schulwerk on an international level. There are musical examples and historical pictures, and it is a really fascinating look into the history of the movement. But I'll say that this book is really more for people who want to know the history of Orff Schulwerk and maybe a little bit less about the pedagogy. I'm the sort of person who watches Discovery in the History Channel, and I love seeing that history. So this book gives me insights into how um, the Schulwerk developed and a little bit more of Orff's perspective. And so that's why I love this book. If you're looking for a great read about the pedagogy of Orff Schulwerk and how to put these ideas into practice, then you should look for a book called Elementaria by Gunild Kateman. 
Elementaria is a fundamental and practical handbook to Orff Schulberg. The author, Kate Mon, gives suggestions and examples without insisting on one exclusive method. She offers well-tried solutions without excluding other possibilities and individual variations. This book has been amazingly influential for teachers all around the country, and that's one of the reasons that right now, if you are a member of AOSA, um, the organization is doing a book study of this book, and you can actually get in on that if you go to AOSA.org and you look up um, Elementaria and you look up on the website about Kate Mon, you can find they are doing a book study right now that you can get involved with. Two other books which have been really valuable are Discovering Orf by Jane Frazee and Exploring Orf by Arvita Steen. Both are really, really wonderful resources and give you insights into Orf Schulwerk as a whole and how to implement Orf ideas into your classroom. Either or both would be great additions to your professional library. Discovering ORF has in-depth information about ORF media. So for instance, speech, movement, song, instruments, listening. It tells you about the pedagogy and how to implement, um, how to use ORF in your classroom. And it also gives you the theory behind the music. For example, why we use ostinati or melodic ideas and how the drone bass or the bordoon is used in ORF teaching. This book also gets into ideas at each grade level, going grade by grade with different content areas like rhythm, melody, etc., and lesson ideas for each. Exploring ORF was published after Discovering ORF and sort of builds off of it, where Discovering ORF gives you ideas about ORF media, pedagogy, and orchestration theory. Exploring ORF dives a lot more into curriculum and lesson planning and has hundreds of pages of ideas for grades K through 5. Both are totally fantastic resources to have at your fingertips and would be a great thing to purchase and read over summer break or any time during the year. There are so many other great resources to include about Orf Schulwerk, and I can't talk about them all in this one episode. So instead, I'll put links to those resources in the show notes. So if you're listening on an iPhone or other Apple device, you can swipe up on the screen to see the episode notes and find links right there. Or if you're listening on SoundCloud, you can scroll down to the episode description where it says resources mentioned in this podcast. And I'll do my best to include links for um, books about Orf Schulwerk, pedagogy, lesson plans, etc. And also the movement resources that I talk about with Laura in the second half of this podcast. I'm including links to Amazon so that you can see the ISBN numbers and description, but I would encourage you to look all over and even write down some of the titles in this list. Don't feel like you need to buy each book, but you know, ask at your local ORF chapter if someone has one of these books for you to borrow or look at local bookstores. You, know, you could even get some of these books through interlibrary loan if you wanted. Whatever you end up doing, check out the list and keep these books in mind as you plan your summer reading list and think ahead for professional development. Well, it's my pleasure to welcome Laura Peterson to the podcast today. Laura is an Orf Schulwerk trained teacher living and working in Washington, D.C. She not only holds level three and master level certifications in Orf Schulwerk pedagogy, but has also studied at the Orf Institute in Salzburg, Austria. Laura teaches movement in AOSA approved summer teacher education courses and has presented workshops throughout the country. She currently serves as Region 4 representative on the National Board of Trustees of the American Orf Schulberg Association. Laura Peterson, thanks so much for taking the time to talk with me today. Thank you so much for having me. Well, before we get too far into our conversation, could you just tell listeners a little bit more about yourself? You know, where do you teach, your, the grades you teach, and maybe a little of context about your school and just for fun something um, interesting or quirky or cool about where you live? Sure. So I teach at St. Patrick's Episcopal Day School, which is an independent school right in Washington, D.C. And the school itself has nursery through grade eight students. I teach nursery, kindergarten, grade four, and I team teach grade five. So quite a range of ages. Um, and I also have a grades four and five choir with the, about 100 students. And we have a grades four and five ORF ensemble, which has about 50 kiddos. 
and what else? Oh, Washington, D.C. is so amazing. It's the nation's capital. There's always something happening, whether it's the museums that are free, uh, wonderful art to check out. I love looking at art. Um, there's always something to do and great food. I have heard about all of those things. People will say, Washington, D.C., museums, food. That's so cool. Yeah. And man, <laughs> what a range at your school. That's definitely, I'm sure, challenging, but so fun. It is. It is both. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Lots of rewarding moments. Well, how did you become a part of the ORF community or what drew you to ORF Schulberg? Yeah, so I think I'm one of the rare people that actually had an ORF teacher as an elementary school student. So way back in the 90s, my music teacher, Mrs. Truitt, she was an ORF teacher, which I didn't realize at the time, but now reflecting back on what she did, I recognize that she must have had training. Um, and I was exposed to ORF in college, of course, through music education, um, as well as Kodai and Dow Crows, but I just felt this sort of natural pull towards ORF. Um, I just, I loved the sort of organic and childlike nature of what it was all about, and so it just drew me in, and I taught for a couple of years, and then I decided to start my levels, and so I did my levels um, all three in a row, three summers in a row, and I haven't really looked back since. <laughs> wow, that's so great and so cool that you have, I mean, you had that ORF experience growing up. Yes, it was wonderful. And I will also say that my paternal grandmother was a music teacher, and she was an early adapter of using ORF within a church music setting. And so I was also exposed to that growing up as well. And I didn't, again, I didn't really realize what was happening around me. <laughs> But now, you know, now that I'm older and can reflect back on those days, I can remember and it's just awesome to have those experiences. Absolutely. Can you give a two minute or less description of the Orr Schulberg approach? I, I will try. <laughs> <This> <laughs> I know, that's the, a hard question. Yeah, this is always the hard thing and it's something that we... As educators in the summer, I'm teaching the participants, you know, encouraging them to come up with their elevator speech, their airplane speech, but yet I, I need to always think about mine too. <laughs> so I think um, one of the most important things to remember is that the origins of Orf Schulwerk is really this idea that out of music came movement and out of mu movement came music. So this idea that music and movement are on equal footing and they were, that's how it, this approach and process was uh, sort of started way back in the 30s and 40s. Um, and so thinking about that and then thinking about the idea that it's a very child-centered um, way of learning music through which we say the old ORF mantra of sing, say, dance, and play. And I like to throw create into the mix. Um, and so the kids are learning music. It's a very active way to learn. It's very experiential. And one of the most important things is that the kids are actively making the music themselves constantly, whether it's body percussion or speech or little melodies, putting them all together, creating dramatic stories. Um, they are the ones that are coming up with the ideas and coming up with the music. And as the teacher, I'm just here to facilitate and to help guide them along the way. And so it's just such a wonderful and magical way to learn music, I think. Absolutely. And it's always evolving. It's always evolving. That's the really cool thing. Yeah, it's never stagnant. There's always something different, something yes. new. Yes. Well, do you think there are any common misconceptions about the Schulberg or levels training or something else that you'd like to address? Um, I think something that people often think is that ORF equals instruments. <laughs> ORF, you know, they think about ORF Schulwerk, and the first thing they think about is the xylophones and the glockenspiels and the metallophone, metallophones. And that is not the only part of ORF Schulwerk. As right. we know, um, ORF Schulwerk encompasses many different media. Um, there's body percussion, there's speech, there's singing, there's movement. We have the pitched instruments, we have unpitched instruments. So it's really not just about the barred instruments. And I would say to people who don't necessarily have a lot of barred instruments in their classroom, that you can still do ORF. <laughs> ORF can still be wonderful and magical 
because it's about the process of how you are teaching and reaching these students. It's not about the what you are using. Right. Well, um, you know, I think something that's very interesting about Orff Schulberg that sort of sets it apart from some other approaches is how Orff includes movement. Could you speak just a little bit to how movement is included as part of the Orff Schulberg? Sure, absolutely. So to repeat what I said earlier, which was out of music, movement, and out of movement, music, the two really are on equal footing. And my first thing that I always say to people when they ask me, why movement? Why is movement such an important part? I ask them to picture an orchestra playing. And when you picture an orchestra playing, they're not just sitting there stagnant, you know, playing their violins. Almost every single person in the orchestra is feeling the music and moving in some way with their body. And so that just embodies this idea that movement is really an essential part of what we are doing with our kids. And also, if you've ever met kiddos, they love to move and they are constantly moving. And so why not take that energy and harness it into something awesome? (laughs) Absolutely. And I mean, movement is traditionally part of the Orff Schulberg. I mean, it it goes back to through our history. That's right. And so the history of the Schulwerk is that, you know, you had Gunild Kaepman, who is, for me, the unsung hero of Orff. I love her very much. <laughs> she, is, <laughs> she is my personal hero. Um, she was a student um, who was a great musician, and she was also a great mover. And Carl Orff saw that and recognized that. And when she sort of reached the graduation age, he tap, tap, tapped her on the shoulder and asked her if she would be interested in uh, working together to create a school that could train musicians and movers to be equally adept at both. And so this is sort of where this idea came that music and movement were on equal footing. He wanted his musicians to be really good movers and they wanted the movers to be really good musicians to be able to accompany themselves on simple instruments while they were moving. Um, And so that's really the, the origins of where this all started. And then they... After World War II, they reunited and sort of took the same idea and started working on that for children, taking this music for children, um, more simple ideas, pentatonic-based, um, and started making radio broadcasts, which were wildly popular. And then out of that grew the Orff Institute in Salzburg, where you could physically go to this studio and learn music in this way, music and movement through the Orff Schulwerk process with Gunild Kaepmann. The interesting thing is that Orff, Carl Orff actually never really worked with kids himself. He never interacted with the children. That was all Kaepmann. Gunild Kaepmann was the one who um, taught the kids, worked with the kids, and was really, from what I've read and heard, quite magical when working with the kiddos. Yeah, everything I... I know about her or read about her. I'm like, man, I want to know more, you know? Right. And so humble and really did not like the spotlight um, and would be very uncomfortable with people saying that she is really the one behind (laughs) Orff Schulwerk because she wrote much of the primary source material. Um, But yeah, she just, I wish I had the chance to meet her. That would have been amazing. Well, I know that these these people who inspired all of Orff Schulberg had, you know, training in dance and movement. And I mean, it it goes back to a movement school where all of this sort of, you know, started and, and grew from. Right. But I know that a lot of people nowadays are maybe intimidated by that because sure. they're like, I'm not a dancer. <laughs> I, don't, yeah. I don't do this. You know, so are, do you think there are some easy ways that you might sort of start to incorporate movement into lessons or some examples that would maybe put people more at ease? Yes. The very first place that you should start if creative movement is something that is uncomfortable for you A really great place to start is taking the idea of locomotor and non-locomotor. So um, traveling movement versus stationary. And you can do a lot with just those two big ideas. So first, you know, you can explore 
in fact, I'm doing this right now with my fourth graders, explore the ideas, all the different ways that you can travel from one place to another and not just walking, right? Thinking about all of the more interesting ways, crawl, crawling, creeping, slithering, um, leaping, galloping, all of these really fun words. And then thinking about all of the different ways that you can explore in, in one place, so the non-locomotor. And then once your kids feel really comfortable with that, then you can start adding little changes, like can you do them in different pathways or could you do them on different levels? Or maybe you could change the direction or maybe you could change the size. So once you've sort of started and had them feel comfortable with the locomotor, non-locomotor, then you can start to deepen the experience and take it into the more creative movement vocabulary. I, I love talking with you about this because it, I mean, first of all, it's just very clear. You're, you're a great teacher, but oh, it's, I mean, it's fun because I, you know, I hear you talking about these different pathways to get to a good movement experience and it's all scaffolding, you know, it's yes. all just like, and it, and it's not like, let me put on a track and like, go move, you know, it's right. like giving exactly. them t- tangible things to take yeah. and expound upon. Yes, I'm so glad that you said that because it really, something that I talk a lot about in the summer when I'm teaching other teachers is this idea of scaffolding. You can't just go in on day one if your kids have never had any kind of creative movement and say, okay, go create something amazing, right? They're not going to have any tools to draw from. So you have to build their toolbox and give them experiences And it might take a while, especially if your kids have never done this kind of movement, they might not be comfortable right away. Um, So you have to build, build it up and scaffold it. And it could take a whole year. It could take a couple of years. I mean, it just depends on your situation. Every school is different. But I would say, don't be discouraged if it doesn't work the first time. There's so many different ways to try this and, and incorporate it just to think of, you know, try it a different way the next time and see if it goes any better. Yeah. And this, it's funny that that makes me think, you know, I I need to confess (laughs) that like, (laughs) I am also uncomfortable at times during movement and that, you know, as an encouragement, if you teachers out there listening are also uncomfortable, it's going to take time. If you, you don't feel comfortable with movement right away to, you know, be more open with these lessons. Like, that's okay. Yes, it is. And it's also really hard for adults if they are uncomfortable with something. Sometimes people have a hard time hiding their own discomfort and that's, you know, your kids can see that immediately. And so sometimes we as adults have to do a really good acting job (laughs) of, you know, make believe and make our kids believe that this is something that we are, we feel strongly about that's really important, even if you don't, so that you can sort of convince them and get them on board with you. Because otherwise, if they see you really uncomfortable, then they're going to feed off of that. So you want to really try hard to, you know, make it a comfortable and a safe space absolutely. in your in the music room. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Well, yeah. do you have any like favorite lessons or topics that are movement related that you teach? Uh, wow, that's <laughs> that's a hard question because I every class, every ki- time the kids come to music, we do movement every time. And partly that's because I am a movement teacher and that's an area in which I feel really comfortable. But I think it's really important that every time your kids come to move come to music, they have some sort of movement experience. doesn't have to be the whole time, but, you know, we shouldn't just be sitting at the instruments for 45 minutes or sitting in one place for 45 minutes. Like I said earlier, kids love to move and they need to move and it's good for them to move. And so I, I think it's really important to incorporate movement in every lesson. In fact, I have a poster on my wall. I'm staring at it right now that says every day we will sing, say, dance, play, and create. And I really do try to do all five of those things in every lesson in some form. So when you say that in every lesson you move, does that mean like a big five to 10 minute movement around the room or an activity, or can it be as small as like in your seat, you're doing this thing or at this moment and later you're doing something else? 
Right. It does not have to be a big, huge thing. It could be, you know, singing uh, a song that has body actions to it. You know, that's what is that two minutes long, right? right? That could be awesome. Or it could be something with recorded music and that's maybe three to five minutes. Or it could be you have five minutes with your small group. Go create a locomotor, ABA, locomotor, non-locomotor, locomotor pattern with your group and come back and share it. Or you could have a little poem that you're illustrating through movement. So there's lots of little ways to incorporate so that it's not the full big, you know, 45 minutes of movement, which is hard for kids. That's a lot, right. stamina-wise. <laughs> right. And I love hearing you say that, you know, because I feel like when I first started with the Schulwerk, it was like movement <laughs> before I knew anything. I just imagine like arms sort of nebulously moving yes. through space or whatever. And yes. movement can include a lot of things, including body percussion or, you know. Yeah demonstration of other things yes exactly and all of my levels participants in the summer will be very quick to tell you that my favorite thing to say is okay now do it again but no arms (laughs) (laughs) because that's as humans that's our first instinct right is to use your arms so I'm constantly encouraging them to think about other parts of your body and another thing that I'll say is that I have up on my wall in my classroom the uh, vocabulary for movement. So creative movement vocabulary, the words are right up there on the wall. So my kiddos have become very adept at using that and looking up there constantly for ideas and ways that they can adapt or change or whatever with their movement. Um, So if that's, you know, again, if this is something that's uncomfortable for you, that could be a great place to start. Get yourself a creative movement vocabulary, stick it up on the wall, then it's there. It reminds you daily. Oh yeah, I should be doing something like that <laughs> um, with you, with your kids. So right, you're sort of giving yourself an anger chart, right? Exactly. <laughs> yes. So I think a lot of teachers, when they think about movement, they fall back on just folk dance, and right. they maybe shy away from creative movement or expressive movement. You know, why do you think that might be? Yeah, that's a really great question. Um, And first, let me say, I love folk dancing, and we folk dance a lot. Who doesn't love to folk dance? It's so fun. It's one of those things where you might think at first, oh, I don't like folk dancing, but then, you know, five minutes in, everybody's laughing and having a good time. Um, You know, there's definitely validity in using folk dance in your classroom, and I we do folk dancing a lot. I think because... For most music teachers, they do not come from a movement background. And so this idea of stepping away from the, you know, the folk dance, which is very clearly written out for you, the steps are there, you don't have to think about, you know, what am I going to create next? All of the measure numbers, you know, it, it tells you everything. It's like a little formula. It tells you all the things you need to know. And that feels really comfortable, I think, for music teachers who don't have a movement background. Um, I I personally do have a movement background. Um, So for me, I love folk dance, but I'm also very comfortable in the creative movement world. And that's something that I work really hard in my summer, summer courses when I'm teaching other teachers to make sure that you are building that safe space and encouraging and scaffolding, just like we do with the kids, um, so that people are feeling comfortable doing something outside of their comfort zone because that it, it can be really scary. I think movement is one of the most scary p- parts <laughs> for some people right. during their summer levels training if they're doing that. Well, and, and that's another question I wanted to ask you. Um, if you were a student who are going to be going to like an ORF level one training, what might you expect to get out of the movement portion of training? Or what are some takeaways that you think would maybe help them as they begin to incorporate more movement into their daily teaching? Sure. So I think um, you will definitely come away with um, an understanding of this, yes, folk dance, but also of the creative um, elements of dance side of things. Um, And you should be coming away with lots of tools and how to incorporate that in your classroom. Uh, with your kiddos of all ages, because again, sometimes we do things and then it's not necessarily for one grade level. You can adapt it and make things work across many grade levels. 
But I think it you can also come away with a sense of how movement can enhance your students' musicianship um, as musicians, and that's that's really what it's all about. You know, it's we're trying to make better musicians, and movement helps with that. Um, and something that I always talk about in the summers with my adult students um, is the idea that you yourself also need to be comfortable with moving. So if this is something that's uncomfortable for you, seek out opportunities throughout the school year to get yourself more comfortable with it. You know, maybe go take a dance class at your local dance studio or even taking a yoga class or Pilates or doing something active like um, Taekwondo or any kind of martial arts, something where your body is being active, that will go miles to helping you become more comfortable with the movement portion personally as a, as a grown up. Yeah. And it's, I think so great levels training. I know when I first started doing training, I didn't feel comfortable with movement or honestly with recorder. And I think doing that and, and spending time becoming better myself you yes. know, like being a better recorder player or being a better dancer or mover, yes. that helps me teach better. Absolutely. And if you are not a member of a local ORF chapter, this is a great plug for <laughs> joining your um, local ORF chapter, which typically most ORF chapters have, you know, between three and five or six workshops a year where they bring in national clinicians. And often, Um, clinicians will incorporate some kind of movement as part of their workshop. So if you are going and attending these workshops, you know, three, four, five, six times a year, that's six more times of exploring movement than you had before, which is really great for you as the teacher and then will in turn benefit your kiddos at school because you are developing yourself and, you know, working on your own skills. And you can't find a more safe and encouraging place than a nope, you know exactly. group of other ORF people. It's you know I like to say that the ORF my ORF chapter here is like a part of my extended family, and I've I've been in this chapter for a long time, and some of my very best friends I met in level one you know a million years ago, and I I don't know what I would do without them. They're my family. They're amazing. It's it's an incredible, cohesive, um, collaborative group of people. And it's just so awesome that we get that as ORF teachers. It's so awesome. Well, if you were going to give recommendations of, you know, movement resources or places where people can get some mm-hmm. support, or sure. do you have any resources that are your go-to places? Yes, absolutely. So top of the list would be the book called Creative Dance for All Ages. And this is by Anne Green Gilbert. And she is a dancer. She does not have a a music background, Um, but she has written this awesome resource, which basically outlines all of the elements of dance, so the creative movement dance words, Um, and then it's chock full of exploratory activities in which you can work with your kiddos on, say you wanted to do skipping one day, you can look at the skipping section, and there's 25 different ideas for how you can skip or different ways to think about skipping. So it's just a really great resource, especially for people who are um, not as comfortable with creative movement. This is a great starting place because it has go-to built-in things that you can open the book and say, go. And there it is. So that's my number one favorite book. (laughs) And then I would say um, for folk dance type stuff, I love the Amadons, anything by, you know, the New England Dancing Masters, which is the Amadons, they, their resources are amazing. Uh, the Shenanigans out of Australia, their stuff is awesome. And their things, I believe, are on Spotify, which is really cool. Although you don't get the booklet, which gives you some directions. <laughs> um, and then always be collecting resources. So I'm constantly adding things to my pile of resources to use with my kids, whether it's um, a really cool piece of music that I heard that I thought would work well with movement or, you know, a song game or a play party or a new folk dance. And then lastly, just be sure that when you're playing music for your students that you're using the top quality music. You know, we're not playing 
synthesized music for them. We want we want to expose them to the best quality music that we can find. And that's really something I feel really strongly about. <laughs> Well, no, absolutely. You want to give them that exposure to good music making. Yes. Well, if you could tell music teachers out there one reason they should explore Orff Schulwerk, what would it be? It's really hard to pick one. <laughs> <laughs> oh, gosh. Um, one reason to explore Orff. I, I think that for me and I've seen this with my kiddos, it just makes us better humans because you're educating the whole child. You're not just teaching them to sing or to play an instrument or how to move. We are working on those, all of the 21st century learning skills. And for me, that's, we are helping to, it's so corny, but we're building the future and we are helping to build amazing collaborative, deep thinkers. And that's what we need in the future. And I think that is just, that's amazing. I totally agree. And I, I don't know that I've heard, excuse me, I don't know that I've heard other teachers sort of talk about or quite like that. And I agree it's you're, you're building a student through all of these different things that you do. That's so cool. Yeah. I mean, they, it always, you know, there's always the newest initiative, right. That comes down through the schools and the, all the ORF teachers are already saying like, we already do all of that. Right. You know what I mean? Like we've been doing that for years. Right. (laughs) Collaborating. We got that project based learning. We've done that. (laughs) We're doing that tomorrow. Yes, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Well, Laura so. Peterson, I really want to thank you for taking the time to talk with me about your experience with Orff Schulwerk and sharing some of your expertise and insights. This has been a really wonderful conversation. Thank you so much. You're so welcome. I've really enjoyed it. Thank you so much for having me. Laura Burkaw Peterson teaches general and choral music at St. Patrick's Episcopal Day School in Washington, D.C., Laura teaches movement in AOSA approved summer teacher education courses in Denver and LA and is an invited presenter both locally and nationally. If you have any follow-up questions for Laura, you can email her at lbporfmovement at gmail.com. That's lbporfmovement at gmail.com. That's all for this episode of the podcast, but check back in the coming weeks for more conversations with ORF specialists from around the country. If you're interested in learning more about ORF Schulberg, finding a local ORF chapter, or attending ORF teacher training, you can find all the information you need at aosa.org. My name is David Rao, and you have been listening to Make Moments Matter, a music education podcast. 